kinds of drugs and treatments are helping in the international fight against coronavirus. And that's where we start this Wednesday's show. I'm Carl Azus, happy to have you watching. Worldwide, there have been more than 117 million positive COVID tests since the pandemic began last year. That's according to Johns Hopkins University. It says more than 2.6 million deaths have been associated with the disease. Over 526,000 of them have been in the United States, the hardest hit country. The overall survival rate for coronavirus is estimated to be about 99.5%. That's when averaged across all ages and includes estimates of people who catch it but have no symptoms. There's been progress in the search for effective medicines, antiviral drugs, antibody treatments, and a 40-year-old antidepressant are all showing promise in their testing phases of stopping or reducing the virus's effects. When it comes to vaccines, there are now three of them available in the United States. Johnson & Johnson has joined Pfizer and Moderna in getting emergency use approval for its vaccine. Emergency use means a drug can be given out during an emergency, even though it hasn't been fully evaluated for safety and effectiveness. The Centers for Disease Control says more than 31 million Americans have been fully vaccinated against coronavirus. That's more than the total number of positive COVID tests the U.S. has recorded. Medical researchers say the vaccines help protect people against catching COVID-19 and that there's growing evidence they help prevent the spread of COVID-19. What's unknown is how long the vaccine's protection from the virus will last and if they're effective against new mutations, new versions of coronavirus. Many Americans have followed federal, state, and local guidelines when it comes to COVID restrictions. Many haven't and carried on with life as usual. For those who've been vaccinated, the government's guidelines are changing. We are starting to turn a corner. For the more than 31 million Americans fully vaccinated, some new guidance from the CDC. Now the fully vaccinated can visit with other fully vaccinated people indoors. No masks or social distancing required. They can also have indoor visits with low-risk unvaccinated individuals from a single household without masks or social distancing. If grandparents have been vaccinated, they can visit their daughter and her family even if they have not been vaccinated. And if exposed to someone who is COVID-19 positive, fully vaccinated individuals no longer need to quarantine if they are asymptomatic. But travel is still discouraged, so is hanging out in large crowds. And wearing masks and physical distancing in public is strongly encouraged, even if you're fully vaccinated. If you've been waiting to get a haircut or see the dentist, you can do that. Uh, but it's not an all clear. We are not done yet. COVID isn't done with us. The variants are still a risk. While coronavirus-related deaths and hospitalizations are on the decline, new infections in the United States are plateauing at high levels. 10-second trivia. What was invented by Cornelius Drevel in 1620? Submarine, syringe, pendulum clock, or coal-burning oven? The Dutch inventor created the world's first submarine. It was probably a type of leather-covered rowboat. Sea stations and sea slugs are our next story. Ocean research facilities have been built underwater before, but we reported on how it would likely cost more to build a deep ocean research station than it would to put a facility on the moon, and that even if the money were made available, the technology doesn't yet exist to construct something that could stand deep ocean pressures. But researchers are planning for a 60-foot deep undersea lab. I'm a firm believer that humans and technology must work together. And one of the things that we're missing is a modern undersea laboratory, a modern undersea habitat. And so a bigger, better, more advanced underwater habitat is already in the works. And its name is Project Proteus. We're planning on building something that is seven times or more the size of any other previous habitat in history. That allows for us for much longer deployments, larger teams. To be able to bring that to the bottom of the sea is absolutely paramount. Just like Jules Verne, Cousteau is just one of many modern thinkers building up and imagining the future of ocean technology. Architects are reshaping the way we interact with the Great Blue too. The famous Jacques Rougerie, who uh, pioneered some of the underwater habitats. Belgian architect Vincent Calbo has also conceptualized underwater ocean scrapers, while Danish firm BIG has imagined entire floating cities. 
we may travel deeper than ever before without physically moving out of our seats. Cousteau points to breakthroughs in automation and underwater mobility that could take us further than the naked eye can see. AUVs or autonomous vehicles are amazing. They have a very practical reason. Uh, they are able to go places for longer periods of time without having to have a human being on them. And just like Jules Verne's Nautilus, powering up these vehicles may one day be electric and even renewable. There's enough energy that could be extracted from the ocean to power the world's current needs without creating significant environmental impact. One such piece of technology is called OTEC, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion. OTEC converts the cold water temperature from the deep water to the fairly warm surface temperature to create energy. Imagine how amazing that piece of technology could be to help solving some of the climate change related issues as we continue to develop, as we continue to expand, as we continue to add more people on this planet that will need that energy. So where does that leave us now? Will these breakthroughs take us further and deeper into the ocean? And like Cousteau, we may one day find ourselves living there? Well, maybe not just yet. It is absolutely possible. Is it desirable? That is something I'm on the fence on. For now, just like his grandfather, the future of technology lays in exploring this untouched frontier. My grandfather, he was a pioneer. He inspired hundreds of millions around the world for over five decades. It opens my eyes to what is possible out there, what does need to happen, and what should be learned from our ocean world. Some people never smile when they see a snake, but this snake appears to smile at us. This is a lavender albino piebald ball python, of course, and it's got smiley faces on it. A professional reptile breeder was trying to see if he could breed a snake with specific color patterns. This was kind of a happy accident. The uniquely patterned python sold for $6,000, leaving a smile on the breeder's face. The question one might ask is, would people be rattled if peculiar patterns were to sidewind their way into other breeds? What if someone co-brought out a silver copperhead or a petunia pit viper? Would it be too constrictive of a buyer's budget or viper it out completely? Or could a creatively colored cotton mouth become a great idea? I'm Coral Azuz, happy to slither out of snake puns on CNN 10. Wall High School, you were wall to wall awesome in Wall, New Jersey. Thank you for subscribing and commenting on YouTube.